Jared Poland Fronos Photo. Dot com and this is a real world raw file review between the Canon R3, the Sony A93 with firmware 1.0, which is production firmware. And just for fun, I put the A1 out there as well to get raw files from that because there's been a lot of people wondering who have A1s, how does it compare to the A93? So what did I shoot? Well, I went to St. Joseph's University where they had a women's basketball game. And one of the good things about shooting at St. Joe's for this particular test is that they have some older lighting up there in the rafters. It's not the newest LED lights, so it's something that's good to use for a test like this because generally speaking, you start at about 4,000 ISO when you're shooting there. So we're gonna go look at images side by side first that are unedited RAW files because a lot of people always say, well, we don't wanna see your edits. Well, I'm gonna show you the unedited and then we're gonna jump ahead at some point and I will show you the final edits from all of the cameras because I like to share what the final files end up looking like. So the whole point of this video is pretty much taking the Canon R3, which is a stacked sensor, and then putting the A93, which is also a stacked sensor, but it has a global shutter in it. And a lot of people have said that, well, with global shutters, you tend to lose some dynamic range and you tend to lose some high ISO capability. Also, that the A93's base ISO for stills is 250. So that is why we're putting them side by side. Will we see a difference between the ISOs that's noticeable or did Sony do a good job getting it basically the same as the R3 and the A1 to make it like it doesn't even matter that they went with the global shutter. So I do want to let you know there is a link down below that will take you over to Flickr where there will be the full res exported JPEGs of both the unedited as well as the edited and the side-by-side -side high ISO tests and dynamic range. I would love to put up raw files but I'm not putting up gigs and gigs of files for people to download so you will have the full res JPEG there. Also, don't forget that YouTube does do some compression to the video when you are watching it online, but we are gonna do the best that we can here. We're gonna start with this image. We're gonna have the Canon R3 on the left and we're gonna have the A93 over on the right. This is 4,000 ISO and I chose to use the same exact shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and lenses. So I use the 135 on the R3 and I use the 135 on the A93, they're both 1.8s. The reason I did that is so that 135 is 135. Any way you slice it, it's gonna be that. The first thing that I noticed that the Canon one looks slightly darker than the Sony, and that might be because the Sony's 1.8 or their T-stop might be slightly different than whatever the 135 Canon's is, but I wanted to leave the same exact settings so that everybody can't say, well, they're different. So we've got 1 2500th of a second at 1.8 at 4000 ISO on both of them. And we're gonna dive in one to one and take a look. It's in a book and it is reading rainbow. Um, staring at these, it is very difficult at first glance to sit here and say that one is better than the other or one stands out to me more than the other. Cause I can't have the exact same moment with two different cameras, but I tried my best to find moments that were very similar. So one thing about this image, you can see with the Canon, you have a little bit of banding or flicker from the board vertically, cause we're shooting vertical. And on the uh, A93 side, you might be saying that looks like that, but those are just the pixels that you're capturing. So you're not gonna get banding or flickering from an LED board over there. Now the next image is also at 4000 ISO, and you'll notice that the white balances match, right? This was auto white balance white on both of them and the lighting in there is all over the place, but you can see that they're matching straight out of the camera. Now, when we zoom in one-to-one -one here, again, let's look at the boards. You can see, I mean, it looks like there's lines on the board on both of them, but that's just probably the nature of the LED board that they're using here, but it's more prevalent over on the left-hand side. And that's not really that big of a deal. We're kind of used to that in the background, but it could be a problem if it's flickering super fast and you're getting really weird lines, it could become a distraction. And that is one of the things that the global shutter gets rid of is the fact that you won't have that type of distraction in the background. I do wanna pat myself on the back for being able to get a very similar image with both cameras. Good job, Jared, I'm gonna do it. Pat myself on the back. Let's see. In this one, looking at the Canon, 
versus the Sony, God, they're so similar. I, I, I feel like the Canon might have a slight edge in the, in the noise and the grain, but at 4,000, they're looking very similar. It's super hard to tell. And if I have to sit here and pixel peep to see the difference, then it's close enough that it's plenty good on the Sony front. Now we move up to 6400 ISO. I went to 1 4,000th of a second at 1.8 at 6400. Generally is not where I would personally shoot this, but there is no reason that you couldn't shoot it like this. So we have very similar images, whereas on the left with the Canon, you can see it has more of a magenta look to it. And on the right, it has more of a greenish look to it with the Sony. This is something that we can correct for, and I'm gonna show you that in just a second. But when I'm looking at these side by side, this is where I feel that the one on the left on the Canon one is slightly sharper, but also the noise profile just looks a little better to me. Now, with that being said, I looked through a bunch of different images that I had from the Sony on the right, and here, look at the hawk on his pants. It looks sharp there, and the hawk on his pants on the left isn't sharp. So is it possible that the Sony one was slightly off with the focus, or his angle was slightly different? That is possible, but these are so close. Um, I just do feel that the R3 in this case at 6400 showed slightly better. Now, when we look at the top and we have the LED board, you can see a little bit of striping or banding up here on the Canon side. And on the Sony side, we don't see that at all. But look at the, the, the way that the noise is rendered here on the, on, the, on the Sony front, as well as on the Canon front. We're looking into the shadow areas uh, in the background. You're gonna see some slight differences. You can download these files, like I said, the full res JPEGs over at the link, which is down below and on Flickr. But again, this is very similar. And, and I do wanna jump ahead because I wanna show you the full edited versions of these two. Here's the full edited of both. So they're very similar edits. You zoom in and you're gonna see the difference, but the color now matches much more closely. Look, when I'm putting photos out into the world, I like to show my edited images. For people that like to see tests, we're showing you the unedited because that's what some people like to see, but I would never put out final work that wasn't fully edited. We're only doing this for test purposes, but look how good they both look when you tweak the files and edit them. They both look good. And I'm not adding any extra sharpening. I'm not doing any noise reduction beyond what Lightroom already does for whatever they do for the files for both of them. But there's no third party software. I don't think it needs it. Even at 6400, both of these files are fully usable. So both cameras pass the test in this case. And I can't really tell you that one is head over heels better than the other. They are very similar. Now we're moving up to 8,000 ISO. You can notice my settings are at 1 2,000th of a second at f2.8 at 8,000. The reason I went to 2.8 is because some people might be shooting with a 70 to 200 2.8 in the gymnasium like this. And I just wanted to push it a little higher, but still be able to freeze the motion at 1 2,000th of a second. Now these aren't perfectly exactly the same. You can see that the girl on the right is slightly behind the three point line where the girl on the left is just in front of the three point line, but that doesn't take away from what we're looking at here. But at first it looks like the Canon is slightly better. Again, she's slightly closer. It's hard to tell, you know, where we're gonna see the difference is when we get into the studio setup at 8,000 or, or, or higher than that at the 12,800, you're gonna start to see differences. But look at the boards. I don't see the banding here at this point for this one, for this particular shot. And of course you don't have it on the other side. Um, I also had no issues whatsoever with any warping. The stack sensor in the Canon has been fantastic since Jump Street when it came out two years ago. And you don't get the warping because the readout speed is really fast. Now you might get jelloing when you shoot video versus when you shoot video on the A93 side, but we're not talking about video right now. I do feel that the Canon might hold up slightly better at these higher ISOs. With that being said, it's not like it's noticeable where I'm sitting here going, the Sony A93's stack sensor with global shutter is by far worse than the Canon R3. It's not that. I'm sitting here staring at these files and pixel peeping them and it's hard to really sit there and say that one is better than the other. 
and that's a good thing for both, and we'll talk about that at the end of this video, but it's also a good thing for, for Sony because people had questions about the global shutter. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you Fropac 4 in action on this photo taken with the new 300 2.8 from Sony, starting with Blue's Clues, followed by Brooklyn. C41 gives it an awesome filmic look. We've got Copper Tone, DeLorean, High C, Kaleidoscope, Mel Brooks, Saltwater Taffy, Thick, Tintype, Wet Hot American Summer, and my all-time favorite from Fropac 1 called Skittles. Boom, that's how great it looks. So look, if you wanna speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point or you're tired of presets that just don't work because ours actually do work, we created 14 all new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack4. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the before and the afters. If you decide that you like them, they are currently on sale. Or if you wanna get Skittles, which is part of Fropack 1, you can get the Grand Slam bundle of Fropack 1, 2, 3, and 4 and save even more. Now, let's get back to the review. Now I wanna quickly show you the A1 on the left and the A93 on the right. Very similar in looks. Uh, same settings, 1 4,000th of a second, 1.8, 6,400 ISO. We're gonna zoom in 100%. I'm not gonna sit here and try to match the zooms up. One is 50 megapixels, one is 24 megapixels. I'm not gonna try and say that they're gonna be similar when you zoom in, but this is what you're seeing. I felt after using the A1, just from a quality standpoint, that I still really like the files coming off the A1. So for anybody that has an A1 out there, I do think you're still getting tremendous image quality with that 50 megapixels, but this test side by side was more to figure out the ISO. I mean, we're at 6,400 ISO, and when I zoom in one to one, they're looking fairly similar to me. Um, it, nothing again is jumping out being like, well, 50 megapixels doesn't look as good. It looks perfectly fine when I'm zoomed in at this one to uh, at the 100% that I'm doing in Lightroom on both of them. I think it holds up really well with the A1. Now that's not even going into the usability of the A93 and the new features that that offers that people are going to want in an A92. Those features in the A93 that are new, the pre-release and, and, and a bunch of other things, the 120 frames per second, people with the A12, you're, you're, gonna want, you're gonna want that in the A12. I'm not gonna talk about usability now, but I, re, I, I did like using the camera. It felt really, really good in the hands, the A93. So at the beginning of the game, they turn off all of the lights for the introductions and they just put on this blaring red light, which we know is not gonna turn out and it's not gonna look great. So I ended up going black and white. This is at 8,000 ISO. I'm not comparing it to the R3 here. This was just to show you the introductions at different high ISOs with the A93 and I did them in black and white and I tweaked the files because I like to edit them because they would just be straight up flat if you didn't. So we're at 8,000 ISO here. I mean, it's usable. It really is usable uh, in many situations. We've got uh, 16,000 ISO. Of course, it, it is usable in certain situations. If you were gonna put this online, if you were gonna print it, you still wouldn't notice that much noise. And I would, I'm just gonna say it right now, I would never run this stuff through denoising software. I know there's a lot of denoising softwares out there. I'm not a fan of them. It smooths out the image. It looks like garbage. You don't need to waste your money on those denoising softwares and now, Lightroom has built in their new AI denoising stuff, which I'm personally not using, but you do have those options in there. I'm just not a fan. I wanna see the grain. This is grain at 25,600, which is the highest native ISO that you have in the A93, and it's fine. It, it, you're, you're never gonna be shooting this high. You really are not gonna be shooting this high. And I can drop my shutter speed if I really wanted, which would have dropped my ISO, but I'm just testing it out for the test purposes to show you guys. But rarely will you find yourself at 25,600 trying to get a usable image. And it's, yeah, it's not great, but think back 20 years at what 1,000, 12,000, uh, 1,200 ISO used to look like in my D2X. It was terrible. And now you've got something that is usable. So next we took this into the studio and, and this really isn't my style of testing. I, I'm a real world tester. 
but I know a lot of people want to see something locked off like this, and so Steven went upstairs, same settings, same setup. Everything's not gonna be exactly the same in terms of the composition, but it's as close as possible as we could get to show you higher ISO. We have a bright area on the left and it gets darker on the right so that you can look at the shadow area and determine does it work for you? So we're starting with the ones at 12,800. And as we zoom in, look into the shadow areas. You can start to see the differences in the loss of color that you get out of the Sony side versus the Canon. Look at some of the boxes when you're going and analyzing these images. Like you've got Optimus Prime doesn't look as good at 12,800 on the Sony side. We're using both the 51.2 and the 51.2 from Sony. So Sony and Canon, both 51.2s at 5.6. So it's all locked off. So you can go around these images, but in reality, if I wasn't looking at the Canon and I was looking at the Sony, I wouldn't be like, this is the worst thing ever since sliced bread. I think it looks fine. The Canon at 12,800 clearly looks better in this when we are zooming all the way in. Now where you will start to see more of a difference is when we go up to the 25,600 range, which is the max native ISO of the A93, and we zoom in and you can start to really see the difference. Just look at the mannequin. Look at how much noise and grain there is in the mannequin and then the shadow areas next to it. The, the, the text starts to be harder to read. It's still not that bad, in all honesty. I mean, look at the aperture bag and the aperture bag on the right. It's much more mushy. And yeah, there is a, a, a Lumix S5 that we have here that I forgot that we had. Um, but you can go through this, look at the, look at the shirts, Look at the grain, the fact that you can still shoot at 12, uh, 25,600 and have it be usable on both fronts is good, but this is where you start to see the difference is at those higher ISOs. And just for fun, we expanded the A93 up to 51,200 and yeah, I mean, that's not natively normally where you would go, uh, but these will be up on Flickr. And also I'm putting up the Sony a1 files, because Steven also did a sample with the A1 on the same set, so anybody with an A1 can download and compare it to the A9 III and the R3. Those are up there at Flickr as well, full res exported. Now for those people who wanna see how far you can push and pull the file, this is the shot that Steven took to show you that he exposed for outside, and then we brought it back. This is the Canon R3 version, and this is done at base ISO of 100. So you can see how this one looks. You can see we went up two stops with the exposure. Of course, you could take it all the way up to five, which I still don't know what is showing people, but you can see where that goes to lowered the highlights all the way down, raised the shadows all the way up, and did the same exact thing with the Sony file from the A93. The only difference here is the shutter speed's gonna be slightly different because the base ISO is 250. So if I reset it, you can see where it was reset to, and the same thing, plus two, uh, minus 100 on the highlights, plus 100 on the shadows. We could take it up five stops if that means anything to you out there. Good for you, you now can see what that looks like. But when we do put them side by side and you zoom in on this box, you can see that the, the Canon file is slightly cleaner at 100 ISO and at 250, which is just a little bit higher, you're gonna see a little bit of more, a little bit more noise. You can see it in the black areas and the shadow areas. But at the end of the day, you're, not really gonna be off that far when you're shooting. You really shouldn't be off that far. These tests to me don't mean that much. What really means a lot to me is the real world testing. That's why I'm gonna show you a slideshow of the fully edited images on how I would have done it. And you can see those again on Flickr as well. I wanna quickly say something to the Nikon shooters out there who are saying, well, why didn't you bring the Z9 out with you? One, that would have been pretty complicated. But two, I more wanted to see what the 24 megapixel of the R3 and the 24 megapixel of the A93 did face to face. And I know there's a lot of people out there on Sony's front who have A1s that were a little hesitant to, they were maybe a little upset when the A93 got announced and they're like, is this better than what I have or is it not? So I wanted to also include the A1 there. But at the end of the day, I think this is a win for Canon 
and a win for Sony. And let me explain that. It's a win for Canon that the files in some areas are still slightly better than what you're getting from an A9 III. And the reason is the Canon is over two years old at this point and the A9 III is, brand well, it's not even out at the time we're doing this, but it is up to firmware 1.0. So that is a win for the Canon front. It's also a win on the Sony front on the fact that they know that there's been issues with global shutters and ISO and quality. And in this case, you can't really tell unless you fully pixel peep that there's that much of a difference. So that is a win there. And unless you're really pushing it to the extremes with super high ISOs and using terrible glass, by the way, when you shoot at 1.2 and 1.8 and 1.4 and f2.8 lenses, you're really never going to have to raise it super high. I push it a little further because I like a faster shutter speed. The Both of these cameras totally could handle it. And of course the A1 still handles really well. The other interesting stuff that we'll have to talk about in the full review comes down to the usability of the new features that you get with the A9 III. And I will say that the A9 III, I said it earlier, feels great in the hands. I felt that it felt slightly better than the R3, which was my favorite camera to hold on to for all of time. It felt great. Sony finally made their camera feel great in the hands. There's some great features in there that I believe that Canon will be able to do in their future cameras. And those features will also end up showing up from the A9 III into the, uh, the Sony A12 at some point. It's just a matter of when it is. So that's the video guys, side by side. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.